BlakeTalkRadio.com. Our legacy is on the air. Listen in as John makes a unique defense of the individualistic liberties and why these legacies must be safeguarded from all those who wish to set aside. Here's your host, John Wilson. This is John, and this is the, this is um, our legacy, and um, I'm talking to you on, this is broadcasting live on Flint Talk Radio and simulcast on TalkShoe.com, and video cap, video is available at StickCam, uh, pod, stickcam uh, and .com podcast for podcast. Anyway, today we're sitting down with Fluid, a uh, man who's in the, from the local area, and he's a poet, just recently got published, which is quite extraordinary because... Poets are kind of like a rare breed nowadays, I think, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 um. I guess I had to start out by saying because I have a piece of my book called Morning Meditation: Preserve the Culture, and poetry is a culture, mm-hmm. like you say, is with music kind of really rushing in. Poets are a lost art, so you know we just trying to trying to keep preserve the culture. See, you know, that's like um, another thing I like to about it too. It's like um, I was, you were talking about it. I haven't read them yet because like, this is you just brought the book in here. Right. But uh, we're talking about it, and um, it just fits really well into the show's uh, theme because um, how po- po- uh, poetry has always been used to do you know to memorialize things, to uh, talk against things that are in the society. Right. Um, and actually, poetry was considered a vehicle protest for uh, generations. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. I mean. Um, you know, just even back in the, you know, the 1800s and, you know, the 1900s, you know, poets were, they were like the artisans or, you know, they were the, the speakers for the, for the people, you know, I mean, because that's why I named the book A Poetic Commentary, because basically I'm just speaking on what's going on from my perspective. I just look at it like I'm painting pictures. So I'm just speaking against you know, truth to power, and that's that's what poetry is. And that's, I mean, I think it's a very positive form of protest, and I mean, it's like, um, another thing is that what about poetry, the words seem to come back to haunt not only the poet, but also the, the society as a whole, once they get out there. Right. You can actually hear um, poems from generations ago that are still mentioned in casual speech. I don't know if you know that, but people say quotes and stuff, and they're not even aware where those thoughts come from. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, you know, cats like Walt Whitman and, and those type of poets, you know, a lot of poets are considered prophets. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not saying I'm a prophet or anything, but, you know, a lot of poetic words become truth, you know, because we're looking, we're looking past what's right now and we're just looking at with the same eye that the average person is looking i mean it's it's common sense you mm-hmm. know and that's the thing i talk about in the book is just my book is really just common sense i'm not trying to show you how fancy i can be with metaphors and things like that i'm just bringing it straight just like i say in the book i'm just i'm just a poetic news reporter you see like um jean paul sartre when he did his about uh, his uh, philosophy they made it more relevant to you know current trends what was going on after the war or during the war and all that and um you know he's like he's probably one of the most seminal influences on tw- this half of the 20th part 21st century and then the 20th century too he influenced political thought and stuff like that and um paul he used a lot of novels he's novels as a means of doing that and right. uh, poems have also i mean you're connect you have a connection don't you to uh the rap and the hip-hop world right yeah, yeah. Um, I think we were just talking right before the show came on. You know, I w- went on tour with Public Enemy last year, and um, you know, Chuck D is one of my influences. I mean, he he's like a well, back in the day in the '80s, he said that their brand of hip hop was they were like the black CNN. You know, they were just reporting what was going on. I mean, so. Um, getting going on tour with them, you know, that's like you talking about the Who or whoever your yeah. favorite rock band is. I mean, imagine going on tour with them for two weeks. Beyond a thrill for you, wasn't it? Huh? Was it beyond a thrill? For oh, you? it was. It was. Um, it was surreal and and euphoric. You know, I mean, every night, you know, I'm I'm either backstage or some nights I would just kind of go out in the, in with the crowd, you know, and just saw from both perspectives, right? Huh? A lot of perspectives you saw on that, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. a lot of, a lot of different perspectives. I mean, and, and they were actually doing a documentary at the same time, so I kind of got just the whole behind the scenes of um, some of the history, like. Uh, I remember Chuck telling this one story how they were over in Ireland um, to do a show. And, you know, back in the 80s, you know, um, I don't know if it was the, the SLA or, you know, how they have the, the radical groups over the there. The IRA in Ireland. Yeah, yeah, the Liberation Army over there. And um, they had to do a sound check 
they were doing it at a stadium, and um, it was actually a bomb threat, you know, during the sound check, and they actually found a bomb underneath the stage. Oh, yeah, that'd be, that'd be scary. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I mean, you know, but that goes back to what we were saying about poetry, how poetry and politics, they really they really go hand in hand. So um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a political movement at the same time. Now, by the way, I'm going to give you uh, the people out there listening or maybe listening the number to call in and maybe get a chance to ask Lewis some questions or maybe you know the guy and you want to say uh, oh, shout out to him. Yeah, the number you want to call is 724-444-7444. And the ID number you need to punch in is 17888-POUND. And if you're a user of, uh, you know, uh, talk shoe and stuff you don't have to you type in your own number but if you're not just type in one pound and you'll be able to talk to fluid anyway i'm um, getting back to this um anyway it's like yeah this is like uh you're not obviously doing this for just money because poetry poets don't usually get the recognition or the money coming in as bestseller you know novels they're going to get you know right right yeah i'm, I'm doing this to, to um just to have a voice you know for the voiceless and I just I got a lot to say, you know what I mean, whether it be about politics or about the current music scene. Um I got a piece in the book called uh No More uh called I Need My Space. Mm -hmm. And basically this piece is, is I'm talking about the internet, you know, I'm talking about the it's like the blessing and the curse of my space and the internet as a whole. I mean, especially for young people that getting on there they can create their own profile. You know, you can be 25. I can be a bodybuilder, but you meet me in person, you know, I'm just this average guy, you know, and, the, you know, you got teenagers going there with low self-esteem. Right. And they can build up whatever. You can have 10,000 friends, but you come back in the real world, you know you don't have 10,000 friends. I mean, how many friends do you have? But see, when I first started seeing uh, computers getting into the everyday house, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit older than you are. Right. I was like, I was really hesitant. I was really kind of, I was actually kind of a Luddite, a person who didn't like technology in the first place. And um, here's the irony of all things. I actually opposed to having computers in the house. I accused having, um, being involved in this one was developing in the Internet was in the early 90s that I got on, right. ironic, another irony. But um, for one, thing, one of the reasons why I was opposed to it, I thought I was going to actually kind of shut people off. They're going to be just clustered in these little rooms and not get right. outside. And the <laughs> irony, like we are now. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, actually, the thing is, let's face it, um, the chance meeting of you, maybe you and I meeting up, would have been slim. Yeah, Very without slim. the Internet. Right. And uh, it's like now it's like I got friends who I consider really good friends. I talk to daily on either on the Internet or um, through on the phone who live in different parts of the country where I would never go into. Right. And they have no reason to go, you know. And uh, that's one thing about the whole political scene has changed because of this. Right. And um, anyway, um, and uh, a lot of stuff is going to be coming out too. I mean, I think this is great because this actually gives – Democratic ideas more of a chance, right? And uh, yeah. now some of your poems, I think, reflect that. You know, the idea of wanting more people's input into um, into their lives, their own lives, the political aspects of their own lives, their own destinies. Um, you could be do a reading for us later on, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I love to. You know, I, I want some people to call in. I want to get some dialogue going. So, you know, y'all yeah, definitely call in. But um, yeah, the the book is called Literacy Movement, Volume One. Presents the cool, the cold, and the wise: a poetic commentary. And uh, we were kind of talking about it off the air. Uh, you asked, you know, asked me why am I doing this? And part of the reason is to promote literacy. You mm -hmm. know, is to get people uh, reading. Or you got a lot of people out there that that they just don't know how to read. I mean, you know, you got adults that said one in four adults are functionally illiterate, you know, which means they're reading at a sixth grade level or below, which means that they can get up, go to work every day, but they can't read the street signs on how to get to work, you know. Well, the interesting thing, you said you, you, you're a tutor for the literacy program. Here for yes, yeah, I'm, I'm a tutor for the Christ and Richmond Center, which is uh, sponsored by, by Genesee County, you know, here mm -hmm. in Flint, Flint Michigan. Um, I tutor up there twice a week, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. I'm tutoring a young lady right now. And she's made a lot of progress, but she's 24 years old. And when she first came to me, she was doing math on the second grade level, which means, you know, 20 minus 15, she couldn't figure that. She didn't know that. So I just, I, um, I'm amazed that, um, so I'm amazed that we, we, have, we pour a lot of money into our education system in this country, much more than um, other countries do, you know, have per capita spent on anything and uh, you know, per, per student, and it doesn't seem to make any really serious impact. Yeah, I mean, actually, like, I did my research right now. The United States, out of the top 25 
countries. The United States is 19. That's terrible. I mean, <laughs> I, I was going to Mott, and uh, I had I was taking a math class. First time I took a math class in 20 some years. This is about four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And my tutor was a woman from Colombia. Right. And she was phenomenal at math. And you know, Colombia is a poor country. No one could be a poor country. Yeah. And uh, somehow she got a decent educate, way better than what we're providing for our kids. I, I think is the problem is we're trying to we're trying to put kids on computers too soon, and they don't want them teaching the elementary the fundamentals first. Right. But um, kids need more homework. That's what they need. They need some more homework. You and, know? and any parents that are encouraging them to, or yeah. somebody at home to encourage them. That's the problem too. I mean, especially in the inner cities. I mean, and like we were talking about before, it's, it's more economic based now. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's just parents. They they have less education, so the children are, they're not emphasizing education. I mean, when we came home from school, we had to do our homework before we went outside. You know, now these kids they they just go outside. Right. It's like and God knows what they're doing out there. You know? yeah, yeah. You know. It's like um no. So let's like, see. This is all tie. I mean, this is a, you're obviously a passionate individual for literacy. You're involved in that. You're putting your money where your mouth is. You right. know, and uh, that's that's good. A lot of people advocate like. You know, I can tell about Gore. He'll talk and talk about the saving the environment. He does nothing that's really on a personal level to do it. Right, right. Um, and you're out there too, and that's um, it's like several. Uh, well, how approximately how many hours a week? About four or five hours a week, or um, yeah, it's it's about um, it's about four or five hours a week. You know that I um that I do tutoring and um just with the you know with the book, it's it took me six months you know to to put together this this project i mean i use my own money mm -hmm. um i actually in the book also have um i have a i have a it's called a resource intelligence guide mm -hmm. and it's like just like a list of the top 20 my own top 20 websites that i put in there um literacy rep websites you know some hip-hop websites you know because you got hip-hop artists that are doing things in the community that a lot of people, you know, if, if you don't do the research, you won't know, you know, like Ludacris. I mean, he has his, the Ludacris Foundation, you know, and he does things for, for the young people focusing on literacy and money management and stuff like that. And, you know, cats like Russell Simmons that are doing things. But if you don't go do the research, you won't know. So I just kind of put a list of websites in there too. So it's not just a poetry book, you know, it's also a, a resource guide for people that want to, you know, keep up on what's going on. I, see, I, I, I just, I grew up in a family that was really, um, we liked the reading. I mean, reading, and it, my mom was very, it was, she was uh, schooled in private schools. She went to Catholic schools all her life. And she, like, reading to us was like reading, you know, and, and right. there's always books laying all over the place. And I, a lot of kids I grew up with, that wasn't the case. And uh, they were like, they were shocked or like kind of dismayed or even kind of ridiculed us for having books. Yeah, you know, it's funny because um, I was talking to a guy about two weeks ago and I was, you know, trying to sell him my book, and he was like, well, uh, he was like, man, you know, I want to get a copy, but he told me this story about how when he was growing up, that his father actually discouraged him from reading. He said reading was for girls. <laughs> if you can believe that, and he said it really, he said he loved to read, but he didn't read because his dad thought it wasn't macho, so he ended up kind of growing up not really getting that full experience of reading, and, you know, he missed out, so... You know, reading is cool, and that's what I'm I'm trying to make, too, for the young people. Reading is cool. You know, it's not just being on the computers or, you know, popping in an iPod. That's cool, too. But being able to open up a book and go to another place without having to leave your seat, you know, it, it, it helps you learn about who you are, too. Right. You know what I'm saying? So... Uh, Do you ever see the movie Shadowlands? With, uh, it was about the C.S. Lewis story and about his, uh, C. you know, the writer C.S. Lewis. I know, right? Yeah, I yeah. didn't see the movie, though. Well, and, the, and uh, one of the students, they're on a train, and so he was talking to a student that had, it was in his college, and he said that his father said that we read to know that we're not alone. The right. student brought this, and C.S. Lewis makes that point in his um, couple other books about how reading is like, you know, let's face it, I mean, there's so much you're losing out, people who don't read, and people, I mean, it just, I, I'm dismayed by it, but then again, I, I'm also amazed at the strategies that people who can't read learn to um, mask it or to actually not to deal with that reading. Yeah, it's funny you said that because um, when I was doing my literacy training, they were they were showing us, telling us like little cues or signs for people that really couldn't read. And one of them is what people do when they go to work. Before they go to work, they watch the news on TV. So when they come to work, they they grab a newspaper and they sit there with the newspaper, and they may be talking to you, and they may be talking about seemingly they could be talking about what was going on in the paper, 
But all they did was they watched the news, and then they kept, same thing as on a TV as in the newspaper. So they could just sit there with the newspaper and be talking to you, but really it was off of TV. So it's not anything that they read in the paper. They're getting it off TV, which is, that's a, to me, that's another downside of the, of the Internet is that, you know, when you can just go log on. Yeah, true, you got to know how to read to, to log on, but, you know, the surfing, you know, you can sit there and surf through 100 websites. You're not really reading anything, right. you know, you're just looking at pictures. Another thing, is, another thing is, too, is the medium I'm involved right now is the Internet, but, I mean, I also say, like, a lot of people go there for, like, um source like they want to look up something and they'll go online and a lot of these like encyclopedias that are on, online are very nefarious. I mean, there, anybody could compose and create, you know, enter, make entries into these and right. there's no consistency, there's no oversight on what's being entered, if inaccurate information can be entered into that and now it's going to become part of the mainstream's uh, mental mentality, this, this bad information. Right. So, I mean, I had um. Because um, anyway, getting back to your uh, poems and poetry, uh, you were um, yeah, did you ever read from like the major like the you know like made the classic you know the consider classic poets or? Um, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't say I'm um, like W. E. B. Du Bois. You know that was a um, classic poet that I read from. Uh, Conte Cullen. He's a, another African American poet during um, you know the early. 1900s. Um, I mentioned Walt Whitman. You know, I mean, I've read some uh, Walt Whitman, um, and then just maybe coming up to like the 70s. You know, is a poet. His name was Amari Baraka. Um, I read him. Uh, Angela Davis. Um, so uh, primarily, you know, uh, Robert Frost. You know, I really like like Robert Frost. You know, so just kind of you know kind of all over the place. Um, and it's it's funny because I. You know, I mean, you you talked about reading. You know, I've just like read so many different books on so many different topics. That also has helped my writing. Mm -hmm. You know, just reading on different uh, topics, not just not even poetry. You know, just um, like I, I like John Grisham. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, I've read you know a lot of John Grisham books. You know, so that also kind of helped me paint pictures. You know what I mean? So. Just a lot of lot of different authors and from a lot of different subjects. Yeah, that's that's the best way of learning. I mean, I think that's the best form of education. Is like a, you go to school, hopefully, and they'll teach you the element, you know, the rudiments of uh, reading. But you come home and your your parents they allow you to read, bring in books. They bring in books. They go buy you books. Take you to the library. And I've just discovered that myself. And I had a kind of economic crunch going on person. I used to buy books. Right. And I spent a lot of time in the public library picking up stuff. And it's like, you know, it's like a different world opened up to me now. It's like, well, um, I don't have to pay for books. I can yeah, actually them out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've been doing that a lot too lately. Um, I just finished this one book called Soul on Ice by um, Eldridge Cleaver. Yeah. Eldridge Cleaver was, um, was a brother back in the 60s. He actually went to prison at age 21 for um, selling marijuana. And um, while he was in prison, he kind of, you know, the prison system kind of turned him into this animal. And um, when he got out, um, he was so angry at the system. When he got out, he actually started raping uh, white women. That was his way of getting back at the system. So he got raped dozens of women and ended up getting locked up again. And once he got locked up again, he started writing about his view. This was during the 60s. Mm -hmm you know, during the civil rights movement and how, um, you know, blacks and whites kind of got fed up with the government really during that time, during, you know, the late 50s and early 60s. And he talked about, you know, um, how dance, like the, the twist, you know, but Chubby Checker had yeah. that song, the twist of how that really kind of helped liberate a lot of people, you know, that in the hula hoop, yeah. you know, because <laughs> people, because the whole thing was your, your mind, you no, know, the government wants to control your mind. Yeah, they also, yeah, they would, all sides, both, both political camps do that, though. Right. Yeah, both political you camps know. do that. Um, they want to they want to spoon feed you what they think is a knowledge, and they don't want, they want you to be terrified to hear anything else. Like, they want you to run in the opposite direction of anybody else that's anything else. They don't want, I mean, in fact, I think that's, they're actually horrified that the Internet's got as big as it has. Oh. They, they can't control it. I'm sure they, I mean... I think at the core they discourage, you know, free thinking. Well, definitely. I mean, it's like um, I don't. I did a show one time. I was talking about. I did a, did a quote about from a guy named Benjamin Rush, who um, was a signer of Declaration, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and basically he wanted. Um, he actually said that the purpose of public education, in his eyes, 
and we can say this is public indoctrination now, um, wanted to basically, he wanted everybody to know that they actually would have to give up all their connections, their family, friends, and everything else to serve the needs of the state. Right. Now, this is an ironic statement from a man who signed a Declaration of Independence. Right, right. Horrifying. Yeah. You know, it's kind of a chilling thing of what he's actually saying is we, we want to control you. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, and that's the whole thing about going back to poetry. I mean, it's such a free, it's a free thinking man's game is, is, is that to me that it was doing this book was liberating for me just to see that first copy in print was like, you know, nothing can, you can't take this away. You know what I mean? You can, you can burn them all and I can just go to the publisher and, and get some more and you can read one poem out of there and it may spark you to, to do another show about something totally different, or it may spark somebody else to write. You know, that's what the whole that's a whole thrust of this program. It's a, one of the thrusts, you know, one of the objectives to get people to think and think. You know, maybe I mean I'm not saying well they can look at somebody and say, well they did it. I obviously can't do it. But what right. encourages people is well somebody's from a similar background. They did this. Why can't I? Right. And I right. think I think a lot of anger in society is actually just uh, frustration that they can't. They can't get what they're thinking out. They don't have a vehicle or means to do it. Right. I think the Internet's a liberating thing in that, that it can now go for this. I mean, I would, 10, 15 years ago, I never had a show. Right. You know? Right. And exactly. So, I mean, it's like, um, it encourages dialogue. It actually puts a face to um, people. I mean, now you're used to hear about movements or what political people say, and they give you sound bites, and now you're horrified or pissed off at this person. When you get down and sit down and talk to a person who's got some views that you couldn't understand, you get to flesh it out, you know, ask the questions. Yeah. That's really important. It's like I got a piece in the book. It's called revolutionary.com, mm -hmm. and I spell it D-O-T dot com. Mm -hmm. And um, it's talking about that, about how, you know, we're liberated now with the Internet. But, you know, it's, it's two sides to every coin. You know, the flip side is that now a lot of movements are taking place on the Internet but it's kind of taking the movement out of the streets because, you know, back, imagine if the civil rights movement or, you know, some other movement was online in the 60s. It might be powerful, but it, it's not as powerful as us getting out on those streets and being seen and, you know, you know, standing in the middle of the streets to, you know, stop whatever, right. you know. So it's like it's still a blessing and a curse, you know, it's it's. it's if we t keep that, take that movement online, we still got to transfer that to the street, you know what I mean, and still be able to make a difference in the street. Because I, um, one of the lines, I think, in that poem is, we're being uh, drowned out, you know, by, you know, by fiber optics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, we still got to, we got movements online, because I'm part of a couple movements online. One is uh, Turn Off Channel Zero, which was a, um, a, actually a documentary that, that we did, and that documentary was to show how, once again, we need to turn off the TV and, and, and kind of, you know, that the average household, the TV is on 11 hours a day. You know, that's, you know, that's, that's pretty much from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. I mean, so the TV is on half your life, mm -hmm. you know, so, but we started that movement online, but we went to maybe about 15 or 20 different cities just doing screenings and, you know, getting the word out. And, and you know, so still when you have that movement online, we still got to still get a get up off the couch and take it to the streets. So. Yeah, see, it's, that's a problem is like most Americans. I mean, um, oh, yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I just to point out, we've been talking for a while, so I should point out we're on um this is uh, our legacy, and we're on uh, FlintTalkRadio.com. We're also on TalkShoe.com. You can also see us on, uh, you know, see a video of us, you guys that we're talking, on StickAmp.com. And um, anyway, um, we'd like you to give us a call. I mean, this is some good stuff here. Um, Fluid's a, I think he's going to be a great poet. I think he's going to, like, a great poet. He's, and I also think that he's also got a really strong social conscience in the core. And the number to call is 724-444-7444. And the, call, the, ID, yeah. the, the ID number is 1788-POUND if you want to call in to talk to you. And, um, yeah, give Fluid a question, or if you probably know this guy or something, give him a call. I mean, um, we definitely like uh, people interjecting stuff here. And, um, anyway, getting back, um, anyway, uh, let's see, see, politics and poetry, and actually poetry actually can create a political movement. Right. Maybe when one, it didn't exist. Um, mm. Another thing is, too, it, um I think what, what I find about amazing about poetry is, like I think I alluded to a little bit earlier, it can it can exist portions of its 
the poems that like lines from them can exist, and they take on an end of their own life. Right. Like uh, Pablo Neruda, he's actually the one that came up with the term ivory, ter- uh, ivory tower theorist, you know, in one of his poems, and, you know, about a person that's kind of isolated, insulated from the, from the real world. Right. And uh, there's a lot of stuff. We have refrains, and, I mean, we don't, and we have quotes from Shakespeare we all are aware of. We don't, if I was going to ask you, well, write down quotes of Shakespeare. Right. You know, you would say, you put down a few, but then you didn't realize, you said the next sentence you're saying, you, you quote something from Shakespeare, even though right. it's, it's part of our language and lexicon, you know? Yeah, it becomes, like you say, it just becomes part of the conversation. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Well, like the ideas of Star Wars. Like the idea of Star Wars are actually based upon some of the epic poems of the, you know, the, um, of the world, you know, of the other world's religions. And there's like a unity, like shared, like a shared strain or strain mentality in some way, you know? Right. And that's, you know, that's funny you mention that because that's just the power of, you know, art, mm-hmm. you know, which... Um, I don't know if I really hit on that in the book, you know, as a, as an overall thing, but, you know, art is, is so, it's so powerful, you know, and, 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 you know, going back to hip hop, just because, you know, I grew up in the hip hop culture and still being a part of hip hop culture, you know, that was part of the reason, I don't know if you remember, this was probably back in the late eighties and the early nineties, you know, um, the government was really kind of going after hip hop because it had started to get to this point. At, at that time, it was more politically conscious than it is today. Mm-hmm. And um, Dan Quayle and um, you know George Bush, you know, won that that whole cabinet at that time. They had really kind of start aiming at hip hop because it had got to that point because that voice was so powerful. You know, if an artist can sell three million records and if one artist can tell somebody to go vote, you know, that's three million votes, you yeah. know, either way, you know. So government and art and politics, you know, well, government and, and art, you know, they they can be one or they can, they can clash, you know what I mean? So um, that's, the, that's the purpose behind this book is to get people more politically, socially conscious, you know what I mean? Just kind of like your, your show, you know, mm-hmm. just, I was just thinking about your title, Our Legacy. I mean, every time you do a show, like, you're leaving a stamp mm-hmm. on somebody, you know I what I mean? So, so that, that's, you know, that, that's powerful, I mean. But no, I'm an old man, so too. I remember the big controversy of the song by the uh, group uh, Two Live Crew, Me So Horny. And um, I used to, I was a subscriber to Playboy, and it was like, uh, they were talking about this, so it wasn't, uh, you know, written up really quite well about right. the controversy behind that. And one judge said, you know, you know, the, the Republicans, uh, Republicans survive a, you know, song like Two Live Crew's, um, me so horny. What they can't, or they, we can't survive is an assault on the First Amendment. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty, you know, and this guy didn't say, come on, to say you like the song or anything. He didn't know his political stripe or whatever it was in this, from this article. But, right. and see, that's part of our legacy as Americans is um, we have a right to say things that are going to offend, but well, obviously anything you're going to say is going to possibly offend somebody. Offend somebody you know, know it's, because we all got different views. I mean, so it's some, it's, you know, it's, Something in this book mm-hmm. is going to offend somebody. Yep. I mean, I, I got a piece in there called P-O-L-I-C-E, which um, I'm hoping one day to start a nonprofit organization against mm-hmm. police brutality. I mean, and P-O-L-I-C-E stands for Police Over the Line and Community Enforcement. And, you know, I, I go through this, you know, at the time when I wrote this piece, I mean, I was pretty upset, you know, because thinking about all the police brutality that goes on, against people, you know, and, and I got a line there. I say, you know, we need to, you know, bash the lieutenant's head in until it swells. I mean, <laughs> and I, that's pretty... It's pretty graphic. It's pretty graphic, but, you know, when you turn on CNN tonight, you're going to see some something that's more graphic than that, you know, when, you know, police officers just, you know, and rest in peace to Sean Bell. I mean, you know, Sean Bell was just murdered here a year or two ago by the New York uh, Police Department, and, you know, it's three police officers shot 50 times. That's what I could overkill. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think we just had a incident. I don't know if it was one of the trailer parks around here in Florida just about a year or two ago. A woman with a knife got shot by, shot dead by a cop. Like, yeah, 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 I remember reading it. So, I mean, I, now, see, I don't want some people say it was only three inch knife or whatever. So, I mean, I don't want to, I don't, I wasn't there, but I don't know who's the actually viable, you know, witness in this case. I mean, but it's like, it's obviously there's something to foot. I think all the times on um, certain positions of power, people do abuse power. Now, you know, it's like, um, 
I've seen that. I've seen cops get cops have gotten abused with me when I was like a teenager, young, like a young adult in the twenties. I've had cops get all go off on me and threaten to kill me. Right. And I wasn't doing anything worth warning that kind of reaction, you know. Yeah. But they get drunk with power, you yeah. know, and they they get that they get that power in there, and they're probably mad because they're only making thirty thousand or forty thousand a year, and they're risking their life, right. putting their life on the line every day. So anyway, so we're going to go to commercial. We'll be right back. Okay. All right. All right. Call in. Call in. Have you ever thought about becoming a podcaster? Are you a talk show host that's looking for additional ways to get your message out? Are you a business that wants to expand its advertising to the ever-growing podcast listening audience? I have three words for you. Flint Talk Radio. At Flint Talk Radio, we have a professionally staffed recording studio located in Flint, Michigan, that's sure to meet all your recording needs. Contact us for more information by going to flinttalkradio.com and click on the Contact Us link. That's flinttalkradio.com. Discoveries. They happen when we least expect them in places we thought we knew. And discoveries have a way of teaching us a little more about ourselves along the way. Welcome to Flint and Genesee County, where up north meets down south. Home to Michigan's largest county park system and a vibrant culture. A place filled with discoveries we've yet to make throughout acres of beautiful lakes, wetlands, and woods, and in the diverse city beyond. Where the uplifting melodies of gospel choirs fill the air, where the work of renowned artists color the galleries and museums, where the fresh fruits and vegetables of the downtown farmer's market awaken our senses, and where the cultural center and planetarium broaden our view of the world. Let's spend a few days enjoying the wonders of Flint and Genesee County, where the joy of discovery is pure Michigan. Your trip begins at Michigan.org. I don't have any audio, so... Okay, now you do. I can begin. Anyway, um... So um, anyway, we're getting back here, and again, um, yeah, we talking about it. I wanted to wait for the commercial break. Uh, you're going to have a well, you got to have a event that tomorrow. Yes, I got a book signing tomorrow at the University of Michigan Flint Barnes and Nobles. Um, it's May 21st from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. at uh, University of Michigan Flint Barnes and Nobles. That's 303 South Saginaw Street, and that's in the Water Street Pavilion. Everybody in Flint, y'all know where that is. So. Y'all definitely come on out. Uh, just su- su- support me, support the literacy movement, and just support some, you know, another person from Flint that's doing something big. It's a lot of people that's come out of Flint that has done some great things, and and um, you know, I'm just I'm just trying to keep keep the the legacy going, you know. So that's uh, come on out tomorrow. Yeah, that's my thing. Is like um, I like to point about the show with the our legacy. Some people said, well, they were, that was kind of a cryptic term, I guess, title, and I. It's one thing. It's about. I leave. I think it's like ambiguous. You can leave it open. It's like, um, you know, it's like another thing is too. We do have a lot to share. I mean, our society is like you and I talked about this on the phone interview the other day um, about way to teach history in America and right. they subdivide it. Well, it can't be subdivided. You can't be subdivided. Uh, let's face it. Okay, yeah, Black History Month, but how did black people get here in the first place? <laughs> right. <laughs> how did what happen? Um, yeah. Mm, Anyway, uh, also the information you just read too will be on uh, Flint Talk uh, Radio at FlintTalk dot com too, and that's also going to be posted on FlintTalk dot com this interview. So, so okay, yeah, so cool. it gives you more of a vehicle to the wider from like range of reaching people. So, hey man, I appreciate you having me on the show. You know, like I said, I I just um, I moved back in September from Atlanta, and um, you know, before I moved back, um, somebody was actually asking me, well, you know, why are you coming back to Flint? It's nothing here, and you know, it's just, you know, it's that type of attitude. It can be something wherever you are. It could be nothing wherever you are. It depends on where you are. So, I mean, it depends on how you look at it, you know. and it, You know, you have to find it. So, it's it's they're doing this in Flint. They're doing this in Los Angeles. They're doing it in um, North Dakota. I mean, it's being done all over the world. So, it's up to you to find and seek out what you want. You know, don't just... Don't just settle for less. You know what I mean. That's interesting. I was just going to ask you that because I mean, it's like um, you said you were in Atlanta. You said you're in LA. I was like, um, I was going to ask you, why the hell did you come back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like, know. Yeah. Well, I actually moved back here, man, for my family. Number one, um, just to spend more time with my family because I'm getting ready to get married. Um, get well, married congratulations. Next year. Thanks a lot. Right. Yeah, to my beautiful fiance Nikki Flemings. I know you're out there working hard, baby. So big out, big ups to her. And um, I just wanted to come back to Flint and, and finish my book. You know, uh, Flint was actually 
it was motivating for me, you know, to to ride around the city and and see. Um, as as cryptic as it may sound, I got motivation from seeing some of the hopelessness and despair because it let me know inside of hopelessness there's hope. Right. You know, you can't say hopelessness without hope. So um, I just I just saw man, it's it's work to be done here, and you know you're doing it, I'm doing it. It's it's anytime we're getting the word out about Flint. You know, and I got a piece of my book. It's called Flintstones, and I'm actually calling out a couple people um, and saying, "Hey, you know, y'all came from here. Y'all need to come get back." You know what I mean? Michael Moore. I mean, he did his thing here with the, um, you know, the Roger and me and the Bowler for Columbine, and he showed how bad Flint was. But and I don't know if he has or not. If he's come back and put money into the community. I know he's from Davidson or whatever, but according to what I know, the uh, according to what I've been told, I don't. I really had a real animus against him. Uh, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. I never liked Michael Moore. I was around when he did his. Um, I mean, he had the newspaper jet mm-hmm. and stuff like that. I really didn't like him. Another thing, but um, actually, people told me who you know were community outsiders basically said so he has given a lot of. He's behind a lot of projects and things that went on in Flint, but oh, good. attaching his name to what it calls. Um, you know, undue anger towards these things, even though they're really good. They're, you know, they have resentment against some people would. So mm-hmm. he's kept his name out of it, basically. And I, I mean, I respect that. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, I don't agree with a lot of those things. Um, you know, but then again, like the a basic secret was the whole story about Roger and me is actually he did get the interview with Roger Smith, but that was on the cutting room floor. Right. But then again, um, okay, he did a good job of pointing out what's going on, but uh, corporate America, but you know. Oh, hello, chat room. Yeah, like, hello, well, chat room. I hope you got. You know, we encourage you guys to call. Chat it up, y'all can call too. Yeah, then, get yeah. off that computer. Get <laughs> on that phone. Yeah, the <laughs> number is seven two four 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 seven four four four. A lot of fours in this. A lot of fours. Right? Yeah, ID number is one seven eight 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 pound. And if you're a registered user for TalkShoe, you're going to have your own ID. But if you don't, if you're not a registered user, just punch in one pound. So, anyway, we definitely like to have somebody call in because um. I think this is really cool. You're getting a chance to maybe meet one of the people who are going to be to get on next maybe next issue of CNN or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. It all start right here. So if y'all don't talk to me now, don't be trying to call me <laughs> later now when I'm talking to Larry King. You know, <laughs> he's a great interviewer. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's interview. a great interviewer. I mean, he has it's it's he just knows how to make it a conversation. Right. That's you know? it. It's all about some people like, see, I can't stand Bill O'Reilly. Um, he asks a question and then he blasts people. And he's like, well, give him a chance to talk first. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, to be a good interviewer, you know, you you have to just be unbiased, you know. And I don't think that's O'Reilly's job to yeah. be unbiased. Yeah, he's like, he's, like, he's, he's on Fox. Yeah. You know. So anyway, the uh, the book we're talking about is uh, Literacy Movement Volume One presents the cool, the cold, and the wise. A poetic commentary by. Yeah, Taylor. I want to read a piece out of there. Oh, definitely, go ahead. You know. Yeah. Um, I, this this one piece that I wrote, it's called uh, Katrina Speaks, and I wrote it. I have a lot of a lot of my poems are dated. You know, I put the date on it mm-hmm. because I I want to I want to remember the time that I wrote it, which will take me back to the place that I wrote it because I I want to capture always cap, be able to capture that feeling. But um, you know, this Katrina Speaks is about Hurricane Katrina. I wrote it from the perspective of if Hurricane Katrina was actually talking. Mm -hmm. And um, I really would like somebody to call in after I read this piece and kind of give me their view on um, where they were when Hurricane Katrina happened and how they were feeling and how they feel about what's going on um, in America right now with uh, you know, they had the, 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 the tragedy in China, the earthquake, and, you know, they had the cyclone in Myanmar, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And um, it's just funny how uh, America, they just they just rush to the aid of these people, which, I mean, it's a tragedy, you know, and they need that help. But when Hurricane Katrina happened, I mean, they sat pat for four days before, you know, it's like somebody had to, I can't, I don't know if I can say ASS, but, <laughs> you know, I mean, they had to kick Bush in the ass before they, before he got out here, you know what I mean? So um, this piece is called Katrina Speaks, and um, I know y'all going to buy the book. Y'all can buy it on um, www.iuniverse.com, and I'll get that out again later, but this is on page 45 from the book. Okay, let's hear it. Katrina Speaks. Tears for fears, tears for fears, 
the burn from toxic water sears, the skin of my grandmother trapped in a basement. This is Katrina speaking. I'm sorry. I didn't know the levees weren't stable. I didn't know you chosen people were unstable by a governmental Bush who, as Kanye said, don't like black people. I cry more than flood waters, which washed away daughters as King Oliver plays Stop Crying. This is Katrina speaking. I'm sorry that I didn't tell you by the time I hit the bayou, I was only a cat three when I was a cat five in the Gulf of Mexico, just to strike more fear and create more justification of Bush going to sleep early on 82905. You lie, and to have Michael Chertoff cover your tracks as London Avenue natives carry food on their backs because grandfathers were decomposing in the attic with no hole in the roof. Proof, 1927, the Mississippi flood followed by aristocrats destroying the levees on St. Bernard's Parish flooded out some 10,000 residents. This is Katrina speaking. My soul reeks with toxic mud baths. I'm sad I destroyed Po Boys, Magnolia, Lord, Ninth Ward, St. Rock. While tourism, View Caray was spared so out of towners could say, New Orleans can come back another day. This is Katrina speaking. Voodoo swimming on broken bridges while the Superdome goes from rape, piss, and shelter to 80,000 strong. Reggie Bush and Tom Benson getting tax breaks. It takes my breath away to know that with the femininity of my name, I could cause a masculine famine as the label refugee is now in the mainstream. Fats Domino missing, trumpets and horns hissing, invisible vocals scream, let the good times roll, baby. That's what Bush might say as Ray Nagin screams, get up off your asses and do something. 829.05, rest in peace. This is Katrina speaking, thanking hip-hop for its contribution, Oprah Winfrey for her solution. Yet the U.S. government is in dissolution, absolution, disarray. I went away, hoping never to return another day. Mardi Gras. Everyday people still sleeping on Canal Street after work? How does this work? No assistance, heavy resistance as we riot at City Hall to express our anger and desperation as the residue of slavery's appearance. Never forget the worst day in American history. The people of New Orleans need us to come down to the bayou and lend a helping hand. God can only save them as we forget about ourselves for just one day and remember a moment of silence. This is Katrina speaking. Katrina speaks. That's it. Very powerful. Yeah, it's like a definitely a dramatic, good, very dramatic reading. Uh, so it's right. like, yeah, that was, I remember, um, Katrina, I was like, I, I never been to New Orleans, so I I didn't know much about it. I was talking to a woman online who lived down there. Right. And she was telling me just before the storm hit that um she was packing a bag and they just, you know, they always had this threat, you know, they always right. lived with it. And then um she was like, I, I hadn't heard for like two weeks, come up to a couple of offline messages and Sean finally I got a message for her, she from her and she's um relocated in uh, Mississippi. Right. And anyway, um she was saying that uh, everything in her house she was like three blocks away from one of the levees that the finally give way right. and pretty much everything was gone and then her ma, her grandmother was really sick and um, when they got her to Mississippi she actually uh, started coming back she started doing better right. she was like medicines were like gone and but they didn't anticipate this being such a uh, severe fall, a storm so they thought it was just you know we'll go away for like a few hours they're going to say all clear right. yeah it's like the levees were like in horrible shape and it's like uh, it was it was I, I mean I couldn't imagine to see in America seeing these bodies falling down river Right. And that's something you expect to see in a third world country. <laughs> right. Right. And it's right. like um 
I, I think it's probably got it's got to be a, exactly it's got to be a real a devastating thing for America to look, be able to look back on that and see that um, it did happen. You know, that right. it's going to be horrible to our our soul, our image of our own selves. Right. You know, I mean, it was. Right. You know, and it, it like you said, Mike. I actually did some research, and you know, it happened in 1927, not to this magnitude, but um, some levees were in the process of uh, deteriorating. And um, like I said in that piece, there were some aristocratic people, you know, some some rich, influential people that actually um, broke those levees because they wanted to flush out some of those residents so um, they can take over um, take over that that land. And mm -hmm. you know that's what America has always been built on is is land. You know, so it's all all about ownership. You know, so whoever owns the most land you know, conceivably has the most power, you know. So that was kind of what that was about, and I think in part that's what Katrina was about. But there was a lot of people that, that did, common people like us, that rushed down there to, to, to help the people, you know. So and you can't always depend on the government, you know. So that piece wasn't aimed at the government, you know. It was just the government happened to be a byproduct of, of everything that's happened because we look to the government, you know, to – kind of help us, but we can't depend on them, so we got to do it ourselves, too. See, that's a good, gee, I mean, I'll, just, I'll probably have a political view is different than yours, because my perspective is different, but um, I would say that that's right there is like something we have and share right there, is like, you can't look forward to government to solve all the problems for everybody, because, let's face it, these people are politicians. Right. These people are, like, basically, they're involved in a popularity contest. They always want to get be popular, and they always want to be... Um, they always want you to like them. They always want you to vote for them. They want to be able to come and shake your hand like you act like your best buds. Right. But other than that, they're not really effective. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're talking to Fluid, by the way, in case you're just joining the show. And Fluid's a poet. From Call the, in. Yeah, Fluid area. And this, the book is Literacy Movement, Volume 1 Presents the, Col the Cool, the Cold, and the Wise, a poet commentary by Fluid. And you're also giving another spot for your, um, your book signing. Oh, yeah. Um, we're having a book signing tomorrow, May 21st, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., at uh, U of M Flint Barnes and Nobles, that's 303 South Saginaw Street in Flint, Michigan. Uh, that's in the Water Street Pavilion. Uh, you local Flintstones, y'all know where that is. So definitely come out. Um, I'll be reading that Kurt, that Katrina speaks piece along with two other pieces from the book. So definitely come out, check that out. Um, I want to give a shout out to Sherry Gray. Sherry actually, um, she actually organized this book signing for me, and um, she printed up these flyers for me and and um, put the word out around campus and uh, also want to give a, a shout out to Jennifer Prophet because she's actually, uh, they did a story on me on the Michigan Times okay. yeah. recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, which is the University of Michigan campus okay. newspaper. So big up to Jennifer for writing that story and uh, and Mike, the editor, Mike actually put the call in to Jennifer and uh, got the ball rolling on that. Um, I was at, I didn't bring, I meant to bring it, but I was actually in the Flint Journal about three weeks ago now in the people section. Um, I could get you a copy of that later okay. um, just for my community work. And, and um, I got the Volunteer of the Year Award with the Christ Enrichment Center for my, my volunteer work with the community and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, in, in the book, you know, I mentioned it earlier, but you can purchase the book online since we're all online. And the Internet is a beautiful thing because it gives us a, a lot of outlets. You can purchase the book at uh, www.iuniverse.com. <laughs> That's uh, I-U-N-I-V-E-R-S-E, iuniverse.com. And I'm doing a buy two campaign, so I know money is tight right now, uh, but if you can afford to purchase two books, Purchase one for yourself and then purchase one for somebody else, a, a young person, somebody that's really not into reading, you know, just just give them a book, you know, and, and say, hey, you know, read a poem, you know, so. Did you, well, you ever, did you ever hear about Ben Hamper? You know, he's a local uh, writer who wrote the book called Rivet Head. You ever, I think I may have heard something about and that. You know what, he said he uh, was in school and they gave him options in reading and he chose Robert Frost's book of poems because it was short. It was, yeah, it was short. <laughs> right, right. And uh, that's the reason why he got into writing, is basically because that book was like, and it, another thing about Robert Frost, um, he was a very eloquent writer, but he also wrote on themes that are very basic to um, 
tool, everybody. And our, 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 our producer saw hold up a sign asking, uh, right. "Who here if he's running for office?" <laughs> <laughs> and, well, I don't know. One of my little campaigns is "Vote for Fluid" in 08. You know, <laughs> so I got a song called "Hip Hop 101," and um, one of the last lines is uh, actually one of the lines is um, "Did my homework." Uh, you know how kids tell their parents they did their homework in school. So one of the lines um, did my homework in school, kids saved the drama, both for fluid in 08 and my running mate, Barack Obama. <laughs> and I wrote that actually before he even uh, started running for president, you know. So um, it was me and my fiance, we, we laugh about it, you know, about how that, that all happened, you know. But, um, I mean, it's funny you mentioned politics. I mean, because I think maybe two or three years ago, I actually thought about, you know, possibly running for like whatever city I was in, running for city council, you know, um, and then of course we talk about politics, but, you know, to be able to make a real change, you know, I don't know if it could be done within the confines of the political system because, you know, once you get, the higher you go up, the more interests you got to serve right. that are not, like I just read, um, <laughs> These smart people, well-spoken people. That's that's yeah. true. I mean, it's okay. It's, it's, the sign was right too. Though. I mean, but yeah. yeah see, I, I'm a very skeptical person of any government. Like, you know, government groups coming in. I remember back in the '90s, I was talking. I was hanging around this group called the Objectivists. It was like, um, you know, the girlfriend at the time was hanging out there, and this one guy was just railing like against FEMA, and he had all this evidence of how inaccurate and how they were going to be and stuff like that. Well, everything I remember him saying about FEMA came true in right. Katrina. So I mean, uh. See, it's like I think the I think the political landscape has changed because I think people people who used to depend on government or used to think they could solve the problems solved the stupidity around you know the issues of Katrina. Right. And I think it's like um, you should. I mean, I constantly encourage people to be very skeptical about the government. And the other thing is too, it's like you're involved in the local thing. I mean, you don't you're not you're a tutor and you don't get paper tutoring. No. And so it's like so. Those are the kinds of people. These are the kind of actions that can actually change things for us. Um, the other thing is, too, what I'm, a, I'm horrified by and pissed off by is that our education system is so dismal. I mean, it's broken. broken. Yeah, it's, it's broken. And um, it's basically all these other remedies that they've offered, doesn't, they just seem to fall apart and fall apart. They don't seem yeah. to work. And they don't, I mean, they do understand, but we're falling further and further behind. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, you look at, over in Asia, I mean, they go to school six days a week. You know, they're going to school on Saturday, and I'm just amazed at the number of days that these kids get out of, off of school. And I mean, they get off of, you know, clean the eraser day, okay? The kids don't have to go to school. I mean, it's, you know, the number of days that they get off, we got holidays off. And that was it. We, maybe, we were so happy to get a half a day, it was like we were jumping up and down. But now, I mean, these kids, I mean, they're out of school, you know, couple times a month for you know nothing okay you know? well talk about education and when we do have kids are you going to are you going to send them public schools or are you going to try to do homeschooling or i really want to homeschool yep, you see, know i want I to homeschool my, my my children you know my soon-to-be stepdaughter she's nine right now and she's um she goes to a christian school that they're down in uh, houston texas and i mean she's got all a's you know she's a straight a student she's doing well but there's still um certain things that I just disagree with, you know what I mean? The children need to be able to speak their mind, and mm -hmm. even though they, you know, you got to sit down and be quiet and stuff like that, but like we was talking about earlier, you know, education system is not going to encourage free speech and free thinking, you know, so I'm hoping that if I financially I'm in that position, I like to homeschool well, my, my kids. See, that's actually economically, um, there's uh, several places they offer, like units, you buy these units for different age appropriateness or the grade right. their kids would be in and you can actually they're not that much, a couple hundred bucks. Right. Right? So it actually that's you know pretty that's pretty when you look at what you pay for the school district you're sending kids in the private and uh, and uh, how much you get charged for that, once your taxes and stuff. Right. It's probably the other thing is too it's like uh, education is like um it's a buzzword though for politicians. Uh, everyone right. I've heard and the thing nobody does a damn thing about it. Nobody does anything that's no child left behind thing is actually doesn't work. Man, I got an email the other day. It was so funny. It said, no parent left behind. And it was like a list of these uh, parents were writing notes to um, the teachers because their kids had to stay home for one reason or another. And these parents, man, they, they can't spell. I mean, they were spelling an excuse like E-K-X, you know, U-S-E, you know. And it's just, 
you know, the parents are the ones that, that need to be re-educated, you know, and then the kids can start getting some better education. But when you send them to school now, the parent, the teachers, they're making $25,000 a year, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't care what your passion is, it's hard to do a job like that and you're getting minimum wage. When you make more working at McDonald's than you do teaching, that's a problem, you know. So I, it's a problem. So I got a lot of friends who are teachers because um, I was at, I went to the University of Michigan. I was there going to school. A lot of people, like, friends happen to go be, like education majors. Mm -hmm. And I have one friend now who's in a Tacoma school district, and he's taught for three years, and he wanted to do, he wanted, he's just so frustrated with the level of he's a, he knows he can't get any parents behind him and all that. Right. And um, he's just He's just, well, I just totally just crawled. just wants to get out of it. Yeah. And he paid a lot of money to go into education. You know, he's probably yeah. got a $30,000 bill. Yeah. And it's like uh, to pay off, you know. But, um, no, yeah. see, it's, see, this is really cool. So we keep on bringing it back home on this because poetry for fluent here is like uh, really connected. It's like it shows part of his passion for education, but his, uh, um, his contempt for government, probably, and the issues that, you know, it just basically it sounds like you're really kind of tired of apathy. You know, you, tell, yeah. you want people to be more involved in their own lives. Yeah, I mean, you said it perfectly. Be more involved in your own life. You know, don't just sit back and watch watch your life go by on, on TV. You know, turn off Channel Zero. Pick up a book. Pick up Literacy Movement, Volume 1, Presents the Cool, the Cold, and the Wise, a poetic commentary. Um, you can get that on iUniverse.com, and you can also check me out on my MySpace page, which is MySpace.com backslash Global Media Network LLC, which is Global Media Network LLC. Um, pretty soon you'll be able to, there'll be a link on my MySpace page. It's kind of getting uh, reconstructed right now, but um, you know we'll have. I'm sure we'll have this, you know, this this uh, taping up there, so. You can go back if you missed it or if you want to pick up anything, you know, me or, you know, John said. I mean, I, I thought this has been a pretty stimulating conversation. And um, I hope people just just do something, you know, do something. If it's write a poem or start a group or, or do something. But, you know, we need we need you, regular people out there, because – the government is going to do what the government's going to do. It's they're, they're going to do their job, and we have to do ours. And yet, anyway, so um, anyway, I'd like to thank you for coming on, and yeah. I'll have you. I'm going to have a, you sign that book for me. That's oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll okay. sign that right now. Okay. People okay. on stick cam, y'all can see this, <laughs> see this autograph. So when y'all get y'all book, y'all come down to the book signing tomorrow, uh, U of M, and you can get it done. So it's like uh, it's been very good to have you here, though. And it's like uh, I'm glad you came on, and I'm. <laughs> Anyway, this is this is our legacy, and I'm, you know, I hope you enjoyed the show. Come back next week. Thank you very much. See ya.